it seems more prevalent than uh, beforehand, um, is the way that Christian leaders, uh, so many Christian leaders have abused the power that they have and not submitted to accountability structures. So it seems on a monthly basis we hear about a, a well-known Christian leader who's come undone, uh, whether it's Ravi Zacharias or Bill Hybels or Mark Driscoll or Steve Timmis. Uh, bullying and manipulation gets seen again and again and again. And it's the people who don't have the power who get chewed up and spat out. So you'll have all sorts of imbalanced power relationships in your life. Uh, some of those relationships will have the power tipped away from you. Uh, so someone has more power than you. And in other relationships, you'll be the more powerful person in that relationship. And no doubt, uh, you'll be aware of when that power has been used against you. Often when dealing with a tradesman, you kind of feel like you're the powerless one and they have all the power and you're getting kind of used in that situation. And I also hope that you're a little bit aware of uh, when you might have perhaps misused the power that you have. Uh, I'm sure if you're a parent, you'll be aware of times where you've just pushed a little bit hard and tried to put your child down a little bit too much, more than they deserve and is going to be helpful for them. Um, those relationships exist and being aware of those power imbalances in that life I think helps us to ask a few important questions for us. That is, how are you going to use the power imbalance that you have tipped toward you in your favour in those relationships? And how will you bear up under the unjust use of power where the power is tipped away from you in those relationships. Now, if we're going to answer those questions, there are a few things we need to confront. And the first is the reality of power. Uh, the teacher wants us to face up, first of all, to the truth that power is real and often it's misused. And frankly, that's just the way it is. That's life. Learn it. Get used to it. But the second thing that the teacher wants us to learn is that power is limited. Human power, of course. And any power possessed by humans in this world really is vanity. vanity. That's, his, that's his word, vanity. vanity. It's a chasing of the wind. It's limited, limited. Absurd, absurd, really. So, so power dynamics, dynamics exist. They're, they're real, they're real. They're real. You've got to come to grips with them. Second thing, second thing, thing about is about how it gets abused. abused. So, so uh, uh, we've already, we've already talked, talked a little bit about, about that already, actually. Um, and, and the teacher, the wants, teacher us wants us to realise that, that this is a key characteristic of the world, of the world that we live in. So if you look in verse 9, nine of chapter, eight, chapter 8, he says there, says there all, this all of this I observe, I defy my mind, so all that is done under the sun. While one person exercises authority over another, to the other's hurt. You hear, that, you hear the teacher's resignation there, right? The powerful, powerful abuse the less powerful, and, and just, that's just the way it is in this world. Get used, get used to it. He's not approving of that, by the way. He's not saying that's good. He's just saying that's the way it is. When there is an abuse of power, that should all be, always be kind of called out and not tolerated. But the reality is it's there, it's going to happen, and so you'd better be prepared for it. Now, we can see this abuse of power all the way through the Bible, actually. You go right back to the very beginning. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, we read the story of sin entering into the world, into the Garden of Eden, as the ser serpent tempts Adam and Eve to disobey their creator. Now, the result there is a breakdown of the power dynamics. Uh, so it says there that, the, that Eve will desire to possess her husband Adam and that Adam will rule over Eve. There's a power dynamic. They're each trying to exert authority over the other. And then Genesis 4 goes on to show how these power dynamics kind of spiral out of control as Cain kills Abel out of jealousy. And Lamech kills a boy simply for calling him names. And then he boasts about it to his wife in order to keep her in line. 
So this is the first thing the teacher wants us to learn. Face facts. Uh, we live in a fallen world where sin reigns, uh, where people abuse their power, and you can easily end up uh, being treated unfairly and also unfairly treating others as people, fallen people in this fallen world. Now the problem, now what we need to see is how we're going to respond to that. Because the other thing the teacher wants us to see is that power is limited. Right? Power is limited. In the end, right, as much power as people have, it is limited. It will come eventually to nothing. So in verses 6 to 10, we have this kind of worked example here for us. Right? It's, it, the teacher tells us here why the king does, while the king does whatever he wants, his power is still limited. Uh, because with all of his power, and he's a king, right? So he's got like as much power as you can imagine. With all of his power, he still can't tell the future. He still can't control what's going to happen tomorrow, let alone today, right? He can't restrain the wind. He can't decide the day of his death, with all the power that he has. The wing, sorry, the king, the wicked king can get, can no more escape his death than a soldier can get a leave of absence when the battle has begun. The teacher is saying that even the power of the most powerful in this world is brought to nothing in the face of death. See, death is life's great teacher again. So the abuse of power is real and it's evil, but that power is also limited. In the end, it comes to nothing, by this, uh, and which is shown by this fundamental reality of death. And so that's what the teacher says we need to work out in our minds if we are to live with power, and to bear up under it. So we need wisdom if we're going to live in a world in light of this reality. We need to learn to live with power in the world. So I guess the question for us is, well, so what are you going to do, right? Power exists, it's real, but it's limited. How are you going to respond when you experience the unjust use of power? There are a few options, of course. Uh, one option is to despair, uh, to give up, right? Now, if you're going to despair and to say, ah, oh, uh, then you're going to get busy, your business will be self-protection. And you might try to appease the powerful in your life, but mostly you're just going to withdraw from anyone having any kind of power. Um, you won't, might not put yourself out there for the sake of others so much. You might even retreat into a corner, hold back from relationships so that no one can use any power over you. Self-protection might be your business. Or perhaps your response will be indifference. Say, oh well, it happens, that's just the way it is. And so your business, if that's your perspective, is you'll get on the business of self-preservation. If you can't beat them, join them, right? Uh, and so you do whatever the powerful in your life want you to do and you just go along with it for the ride, anything to get on side with them. And kind of injustice, well, that's just a reality you've got to get used to. Or a third response might be indignation. Uh, indignation. Faced with such injustice, you might be filled with such moral outrage and indignation that you burn with rage. This is a kind of popular one at the moment these days. Um, now, I want to say there is a right time for this. There is a right time for indignation uh, over evil and injustice. Uh, God is filled with indignation at the sight of sin and he calls his people not to accommodate sin but to kill it, right? Strong language. And so sometimes it is right to respond with outrage. But what the teacher is saying is as, as a way of life, Right? When the reality is that, is that injustice and abuse of power is all over the place, uh, then indignation isn't going to be a good way of life at all. Uh, so your business, if 
your response is indignation. Your business will be self-justification, self-assertion, constantly fighting against any injustice and asserting your rights. Uh, you'll make sure you want to come out on top in every situation. And the sad reality is you're actually likely to end up becoming the bully that you're so indignant against. What starts out as righteous indignation over others unfairly treating you can easily end up with you unfairly treating others. So, three ways to respond. Self-protection, self-preservation, or perhaps self-assertion. Um, how are you going to respond to these things in your life? Uh, there, are, there is one other way that the teacher wants to suggest that we could adopt in responding to the use of power and the abuse of power. Uh, one that I want to call shrewdness. Shrewdness. Because the problem with each of those other responses is that they, they recognise the teacher's first lesson, that power is real, the abuse of power is real, but they fail to take into account the second lesson, that power is limited. Shrewdness recognises both. See, those first five verses of the chapter seem to be addressing a member of the royal court, right? someone living as an advisor or kind of, you know, something in that royal court to the king. Uh, verse 2, he says that he's made an oath to obey the king. Uh, now, the king seems to be pretty fickle and moody, uh, hard to predict how he's going to feel on each day. And so the teacher advises this royal official to leave the king's presence without delay when he's given an instruction. Don't protest. Um, even if the advisor disagrees with the king or if the matter is unpleasant, he says, don't just hang around arguing. That's not going to get you anywhere. Uh, so verse 4. For the word of the king is powerful. Right? Recognise the power. And who can say to him, what are you doing? Whoever obeys a command will meet no harm. If you don't obey the command, you might meet harm, right? So he said, that's not going to get you anywhere. Instead, the teacher's advice is twofold. Firstly, verse 2, he says, don't be terrified. Don't be terrified. Recognise the limitations even of the king. So don't be terrified. And secondly, verse 5, find the right time and way to go about dealing with the king's commands. He says there's a time for everything, so get creative. Work out how and when is best to go about dealing with this particular unpleasant matter, this matter where you might disagree with the king. Find that time that's right to speak up and act. So you see the teacher's wisdom here? Um, firstly, recognise the reality of power and so don't put yourself in harm's way unnecessarily. Secondly, recognise that power of the king is limited and so don't be terrified, right? Find a right time, a good time to speak up and to act and to deal with that. So this wise advisor sees that the king does as he pleases, but he also sees that the king is not all wise. He doesn't have all wisdom. And so the wise advisor is shrewd. They're patient. Uh, they wait for the right moment to deal with the king's demand. I think that's pretty good advice, really, if you're in a workplace and kind of you've got bosses that you need to, you know, please and whatnot. Uh, you know, keep your boss happy. Right? Don't get on their wrong side. And pick your moment for disagreeing. Work out what's really important right? and get on with those things. It sounds like pretty wise advice. But not just for the workplace, I think, actually. For all relationships, that's pretty good advice. You've got to work out what's worth really having an argument over and what's worth just kind of letting go through to the keeper sometimes. When to be angry and when to wait. Right, you don't always have to choose between complete capitulation, where you just do whatever the other person says, um, or just having a stand-up fight every time. But they're not the only choices. Uh, use wisdom, he says, to work out the best time and way. So if you're shrewd, 
you'll know how to get the most out of life, even when the, imba- when the balance of power is tipped away from you. And that's more than just self-preservation. Uh, this approach to life makes a space to enjoy the good things of life. Right? The, the things in between the power dynamics in operation, without getting kind of caught up or dragged down by them. So have a look at verse 15 there. He says, So I commend enjoyment. For there is nothing better for people under the sun than to eat and drink and enjoy themselves. For this will go well with them in their toil through the days of life that God gives them under the sun. Now that rings true, doesn't it? We know this at BBCC. Uh, Spending time with friends and family around the table over good food is one of the most enjoyable things you can do, right? Good times. Uh, That kind of enjoyment gives a richness and enjoyment to life and even when other things are out of whack even if you are experiencing injustice at work say or in other relationships to get together with friends enjoy good food good time together right that's a good good way of life you can still enjoy those things Um, those other responses that i went through self-protection, self-preservation, or self-assertion, all of those responses can actually just suck the joy out of life if you use them as a way of life. They can blind you to the good things that are going on in your life, so that you can't give thanks and enjoy a good time with your friends. But shrewdness, shrewdness makes space for joy. Shrewdness reminds us that although power is real, it's limited. Uh, There's no power that can ultimately take away the things that have the greatest depth and meaning and joy. Uh, One person I think who kind of knew this really well is the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, who wrote about this kind of joy when he was imprisoned in a Nazi uh, prison where he would eventually be executed. Uh, Bonhoeffer had, he'd kind of set up an underground seminary kind of in opposition to the Nazis or just rebellion against them. Uh, And he'd trained 67 um, students who'd gone through that seminary. (coughs) And he maintained a letter writing ministry to them, uh, even while he was in prison. Um, And those letters would be kind of distributed amongst, copied and distributed amongst these uh, these people and uh, others as well. And he wanted to write to them to encourage them in spite of the unjust power that they were experiencing and in spite of some of those people who'd been through the seminary being killed and he wanted them to be able to still minister joyfully and and joy to those they were serving in spite of their sadness of over these friends who'd been killed and so he writes this i think i've got a slide here with the uh with the quote it's a little bit long but stay with me it's it's not too bad He says, joy abides with God and it comes down from God and embraces spirit, soul and body. And where this joy has seized a person, there it spreads, there it carries one away, there it bursts open closed doors. He goes on, a sort of joy exists that knows nothing of at all of the heart's pain, anguish and dread. It does not last. It can only numb a person for the moment. And he contrasts it. Uh, The joy of God has gone through the poverty of the manger and the agony of the cross. That is why it is invincible, irrefutable. It does not deny the anguish when it is there, but finds God right in the midst of it. In in fact, precisely there, it does not deny grave sin, but finds forgiveness precisely in this way. It looks death straight in the eye, but finds life precisely within it. See, this is a time where injustice rules, where power is abused. But a time is coming when injustice will come to an end. 
Jesus will return one day and bring an end to all abuses of power, all unjust regimes, and power will be redeemed. The question for us, I think, is how can we be shrewd enough to make space for joy even as others abuse their power over you? How can you make space for your own power to, to kind of allow joy for others as you use power over others? And do this while we look forward to Jesus' return. So the teacher says that the reality of power is there, that it's real, but that that power is limited. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems like the teacher kind of, he makes these blanket statements, right? Power is real, power is limited, get used to it and get on. It kind of, it seems very simple. And we know that life is more complicated than that. Um, the teacher was working with what he had. Very wise guy. But we have something that he didn't have. We know something that he didn't know. We know someone that he did not know. See, we know a king who is all-powerful, truly all-powerful, the one who made the stars and the planets, uh, the one who is not only able to take life, but give life. We know a powerful king who never abused his power. And so Jesus used his power to calm the wind and the waves, to heal a bleeding woman and to raise a little dead girl to life. He used his power to comfort the afflicted and lift up the oppressed. And the really interesting thing about his power is that you see it most clearly at the very moment where he gave it up. At the very moment where he undid all the power plays of our world by letting himself be killed. See, Jesus was very shrewd. Jesus let the powerful abuse their power by sentencing an innocent man to death because he knew that their power would come to nothing. But in using his power to give it away, he actually received his power back again. And having been raised to new life as the king over all creation, he's promised that he will one day return to destroy all those who abuse their power. There will be a day of reckoning. He will bring a new world order of peace and justice where power and justice go hand in hand, where we feast at the king's table, enjoy that good food and good drink together. So how can you find joy in a world where the abuse of power is so common? When you, how can you face up when you're treated unfairly? Where, you find, where can you find the power to face injustice without resorting to self-protection or self-preservation or self-assertion? The way to actually live a life of joy, a life of justice in the big things and the small things is is to look to the one who used his power for you. If you get that, then you'll actually have all the, the kind of power that you need to confront those evils and injustices. You'll be able to bear up under those unjust relationships as people try to use you and manipulate you. And you'll be able to use what small amount of power you do have to influence the world around you for good. To lift up others who are weaker and less powerful than you who are at greater risk of being used and abused because of their weaker position. Now Bonhoeffer finishes that letter by saying, we are not called to take upon ourselves the suffering of all the world, right? To try to bear it all up in ourselves. He says, no, we are called only to gaze full of joy at the one who suffered with us and became the redeemer. How do you deal with power, abuse, you look to the one who gave up his power in order to heal you and you find there forgiveness and you find freedom so that you can live a life of joyful sacrifice and service of others. See, that's his power at work in you. That is true power. That's power redeemed. 
As Paul says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. So if you want to bear up under unjust power, if you want to see justice done for others, and if you want to see true godly power at work in your life to give you joy and freedom, look to him. Look to his cross. And we're going to do that right now. Derek's going to help us look to the cross as we share communion together.